In the last episode, we were talking about why people with ADHD find it harder to go to sleep. If you haven't heard that episode yet, I would recommend going back, listening to that, and then coming back to this episode because this is going to be built on top of what I said in the last episode. Before we start, little ADHD tip for you. Do you also find it physically painful when someone speaks too slowly? When your brain is moving so much faster and you have to wait for someone to utter every single word when you already know how they're going to finish the sentence? Did you know that you can increase the playback speed of your podcast episodes on Spotify, for example, or on YouTube? You were able to speed it up without losing voice quality. So there you go let's begin i'm going to share with you my favorite tips and tricks for sleep okay now something that is kind of counterintuitive but really important is to get a regular sleep schedule and you're going to be laughing at me like sophia you literally just told us why people with adhd struggle to get a regular sleep schedule and now you're just telling us to get a regular sleep schedule that's like telling someone to lose weight by losing weight i know i get it but there are things that you can do to improve getting to that regular sleep schedule. Now, I know it feels impossible, but it is possible. It's more difficult, but it's possible. I have, throughout my life, every now and again, gotten into phases when I did have a really good sleep schedule, when I was able to wake up at the same time every day. And let me tell you, it really does make a big, big difference. Not only does it mean that it's easier for our bodies to go to sleep, but it also just means that when we wake up, we're not in this fog mode for the first few hours of the day. It means that, especially if I'm some, if I somehow got myself to wake up around like eight-ish or nine-ish every day, means, hey, I actually have energy now to go to the gym or to start working sooner and actually get my day started. When I wake up around like 12, I, I'm not motivated to go and do work because I'm like well the day's kind of already gone anyway why even try which is of course not a great which is of course not a great approach but still that's basically what happens to me in the end you're gonna have to basically force yourself into it so one way to do it is to set yourself an alarm and really make yourself get up at the same time every day if you are living with someone else maybe ask them to help you maybe they can make sure that you were going to wake up. For example, when I was still in school, or even sometimes when I had to go to work, I would tell my mum, hey, I really have to wake up. Please, pretty please, can you make sure that I'm awake, that I'm out of bed by this time? Like literally, I told her, if I'm not waking up, drag me out of bed. Literally take my legs, pull me out of bed, please. She never had to do it because just by me telling her that and knowing it, and her sticking in her head or something, I knew like, okay, no, I need to get up. I need to get up. I know this. It's somehow tricking your brain into knowing, hey, I need to do a thing. So that's an option. Otherwise, setting lots of different alarms. Um, I know some people like to set an alarm in a different place of the room so that you actually physically have to get up and turn the alarm off. The tricky thing is then to not go back to bed. If you are finding it difficult to resist the urge to go back to bed because you just cannot get up straight away, maybe just sit down. But really, you need to hold yourself accountable for this. Sit down, don't lie down. If you lie down, you're gonna go back to sleep. If you do, if that's the way how you wanna work, fine. But make sure that you are setting several alarms to make sure that you don't go back to sleep and then completely oversleep. Or as I mentioned in the last video, a Fitbit watch. Because here you can set a intelligent timer. Let me just check. Intelligent timer. Can you see it? If you set an intelligent timer, that means that it's you tell it, I need to get up at the very latest by 8.30. And then half an hour before 8.30, you can wake me up at any point, depending on my sleep cycle. So if you are already in light sleep, it's going to wake you up earlier. If you're in deep sleep, it's going to wait until you naturally get into a lighter sleep phase so that it's easier for you to wake up. I often do a combination of different things. I know that there's also mats that you can get that have an alarm built in where you have to stand on the mat, put a certain amount of pressure on it for a certain amount of time, like for a full minute or something, to make sure that you are actually going to wake up. At the moment, I'm struggling to do this because I'm working on my own schedule. I'm not in employment at the moment, so I am actually going to bed quite late and getting up 
quite late too. So I'll go to bed around four, sometimes even five or six. And I think the latest that I woke up was 3 p.m. And the thing is that even if I do go to sleep that late, I'm not going to want to set an alarm that early because even though I know it's important to get into a regular sleep schedule, I also know how important it is to get enough sleep. And because I'm not actually dependent on being anywhere so early, I would rather get the full eight hours of sleep than train myself to get into a better rhythm. But that's just for me personally right now. I would ultimately like to have a better rhythm, but that's sort of where I compromise a little bit. What I like to do instead is take melatonin. So because our melatonin kicks in later than it does with neurotypicals, it really can help to take melatonin. I take two milligrams. Um, I think there's different types of melatonin as well. Speak to your doctor about what works best for you. And a lot of doctors aren't actually fans of melatonin because you're only supposed to take it for like a week and then you get into a better sleep rhythm and then you're supposed to stop taking it. Now, if you have ADHD, that's not really going to help you much because you, you're going to always struggle with sleep problems. It is important though that you don't take it every day because your body is going to get used to it. At the same time, studies have shown that there's not actually a lot of side effects to melatonin. It's a very low risk drug. So you don't need to be worried of the effects that it's going to have on your body if you take too much. It's also not the same as a sleeping pill. It basically just helps to onset the natural circadian rhythm that we have slightly sooner. Because, you know, with jet lag and anyone who's ever experienced jet lag before is going to know that you absolutely can shift time zones and when you want to naturally wake up every day. So it's mainly going to help you with that. Still, try not to take it every day so that you don't get used to it. Like I said that melatonin does not have any known side effects. Like studies have shown that it's very, very minimal. I want to point something out that I, even though I had taken melatonin before, I kind of forgot about it. And since the episode, I have been taking melatonin again. I took it like three times, three nights pretty much in a row. I forgot melatonin can give you intense dreams, very weird, vivid dreams. Usually my dreams are very fragmented and they won't make a lot of sense and I'm sort of going from one thing to the next and I might be in the same sort of building complex but parts of it will keep sort of changing around. I kind of feel like it's like Hogwarts <laughs> where it's magical and it keeps ever changing or like people will throughout the dream change who they are and who I associate them with. I think that's completely normal. But when I take melatonin, I have weirdly specific dreams and it usually stays within the same space and the same people. I feel like it's the same story, but the plot is kind of changing. And most of the dreams that I'm having seem to be like stuff that is deep down in my subconscious, like Freudian stuff and also stuff that's linked to my trauma that I thought that I've already sort of processed through a little bit. Like about half a year ago, I started EMDR therapy, which I'm sure I'm going to do an episode on because I do find it incredibly helpful and I find it fascinating as well. I thought that there was one core memory that I have that was particularly traumatic for me that happened in the last year that I thought I had processed through. So I felt very removed from it in like in a good way, not in a I'm repressing it way, but in a my emotional brain and my cortex, my rational thinking cortex are finally syncing up and putting it into perspective. My nervous system isn't going crazy anymore when I think about this person or this particular text message. I felt really good about it. And then recently when I then took the melatonin, I had a dream where I was in a room filled with these people that I've had difficulties with. I won't go into detail because I'll save that for another video, but it came up again and this feeling of like everyone hates me and a lot of the panic is sort of starting to return. It's It has been returning for a while anyway, like the last sort of one or two months have kind of, I wouldn't say been a setback, but have been more difficult for me again. Not as bad as it was back then, but you know, and the dreams just sort of reflected that, I think. Like I constantly have dreams about like I accidentally moved to Glasgow again. Yeah, just a lot of anxiety filled, a lot of disorientation. I will feel so disorientated. Also then when I wake up, I'll often feel like 
what the hell? Like, I, it feels like I'm waking up from a different life. I will get really invested and I'll, I'll have some kind of goal and I need to do this goal. And then when I wake up, I'm like, no, but I, but I still, I haven't finished the thing and it feels really uncomfortable. I mean, sometimes you can get that just normally anyway, depending on how deeply you sleep. It's just more extreme with melatonin. So I want you to be aware of that. Melatonin can help to a certain degree. It can help you get back into a rhythm. If you have a completely fucked up sleep schedule and you just somehow need to get back on track by any means necessary, then you can try it. Absolutely. I don't think that everyone is going to have the exact same reaction to it the exact same effect so yeah do try it just be aware that that can happen just because I said that it doesn't have any side effects I just wanted to clarify that one point in general you should avoid sleeping pills because if you take them too much then your body is going to become dependent on them and you'll find it harder to go to sleep by yourself that's kind of how I feel like with the podcast that I'm listening to right now because it did help me so so much when I started it and also it helped me for about a year or so but recently I've been finding I know his voice so well at this point and I know the structure of his episode so well at this point that my brain is drifting off a lot more than it used to. It used to really be like okay I have this voice that is telling me to like relax from up here down here like do the breathing like guided guided exercises to go to sleep but now it's really hard to maintain focus because the novelty is worn off. Just in general, especially for people with ADHD, if you get used to anything, it's going to be difficult to maintain over a long period of time because you're going to get bored of it. I'm not getting bored of the podcast, but it's just not as effective anymore. But I also, at the same time, feel like I can hardly sleep without it. That also shouldn't scare you off of listening to his podcast, by the way. His podcast is great. I highly recommend it. I'm just saying mix up your rituals a little bit and find ways to... You just honestly just you need to see what works for you. Uh, It could be that doing the same thing every night is going to help you, especially if you also are on the spectrum that might be beneficial for you. I take it around midnight because I'm fine with going to bed around two. You're supposed to take it one to one and a half hours before going to sleep. To be safe, I would take it at least one and a half hours before because you also you might forget to take it and then it's going to be really late and it's better that you go to bed earlier than later. So set a time for yourself when you absolutely at the very latest want to be asleep and then set an alarm maybe two hours before then to take the melatonin, which actually also brings me to my next point. Setting sleep timers, I think, is really helpful. Now, you're going to have to probably set two different timers. One timer is going to be an alert for, hey, it's going to be time to start winding down for bed soon, just so you know, maybe half an hour or an hour before the second alarm goes off so that you can mentally prepare yourself a little bit for it. And then there's a second timer where you absolutely have to drop everything that you're doing, no matter how invested you are, I know it's going to be difficult, but just try it out. And you have to go off to do your sleep routine or go to bed, whatever you want the second alarm to be. I would highly recommend making it a sleep routine because you could say, this is what I do, for example. I'll tell myself, okay, by one o'clock, I have to go to the bathroom to brush my teeth, do my skincare routine, uh, my breathing exercises and all that stuff. Theoretically, if I really wanted to, I could still go back and continue working on whatever I was working on. But most of the time, as soon as I'm away from the work that I was doing and I've done the routine, I no longer have the urge to continue working. It's just about pull. something needs to pull you away from what you're doing, interrupt what you're doing, and then things will basically happen by itself. It's It will be a lot easier to then go to bed. And if you set up the sleep time routine for yourself, it's really important that you make it something enjoyable and that you switch it up. I, as well as every ADHD person or most ADHD people struggle with routines. If you have autism, you might find it easier. I might be on the spectrum, but I still always struggled with that one. Just in general, setting up a routine for myself that I do all the time is very, very difficult. At times, I even struggle to brush my teeth every night. And I'll just tell myself, I can brush my teeth in the morning. If I'll be so tired and I'll already be in bed and just fall asleep, then I'll be like, whatever, fuck it. 
The one thing that actually does help me is contact lenses because often I'll go to bed with my contact lenses in and that's the one thing that I really do not want to go to sleep with. So I'll get up, take out my contact lenses and if I'm lucky enough, I'll still have the motivation to be like, well, I'm already up now. I might as well brush my teeth and wash my face and everything. Sometimes even that isn't enough to motivate me. It was especially bad when I was depressed. Yeah. But that's why it needs to be something enjoyable, something that you're looking forward to, something that's giving you dopamine, where you can be like, hey, I get to do my sleep time routine now. And it's not going to stay exciting forever, which is why you need to switch it up. There's so many different gadgets and like little tricks and things that I like implementing. And sometimes I'll implement one thing, sometimes I'll implement something else. One thing that I've gotten in the habit of doing in the last two years, which has really helped me, is listening to sleep podcasts. My favorite podcast is called Sleep Cove by Christopher Fitton. I'll try and play you a little sample of his voice here. As your mind falls into synchronization with your breath, become aware of every inch of your body. If that voice doesn't cradle you to sleep, I don't know what will. There are lots of different types of episodes that he does. The one that I like the most is the one where it's basically a guided sleep meditation. Um, There are also other sleep hypnosis podcasts on, well, I listen to it on Spotify. Uh, Try some of them out. Maybe they'll help you. Maybe not. I find that it really helps, especially with racing thoughts, because I'll be lying there. I'll have done my breathing exercises. I have my heavy blanket and I put on the podcast and then I'm like, right, okay, now I'm being mindful about the fact that I am lying in bed, I want to sleep, start to really mindfully switch everything off and just focus on the voice. This also kind of goes into mindfulness meditation. If you want to do meditation before bed also, that's a really good technique. I struggle with meditation quite a bit, as most ADHDers do because racing thoughts, but mindfulness meditation is proven to help people with ADHD. And I actually want to get back into the habit of doing more meditation. But a lot of his episodes are actually, well, yeah, they're called sleep meditations. And he'll talk you through it. He'll tell you to relax one part of your body after the next, do certain breathing exercises, and then go off into imagining that you're on a big field or or something like that. And that to me really helps me, even if my thoughts sort of get off track, I know I can always come back to the sound of his voice and try and let whatever thoughts are in my head flow past. Whereas if I didn't have the podcast on, I would just be thinking about it and then I'd be like, no, I want to go to sleep. Think of sleep, think of sleep, think of sleep. And of course, that's not going to make you go to sleep. Yeah, especially at the beginning when I started listening to his episodes, I I found one episode that was like fall asleep in 15 minutes or something. And it really, really did work. I could just put on that episode and he would go through like start at the feet and then go all the way up through your body, then to your emotions and so on. And I would usually fall asleep by the time that we got to the arms or something like that. Pardon me. Yeah. Really, really worth a listen. Sleep Cove by Christopher Fitton. Check it out. Anyway, another part of my sleep routine is, of course, going to the bathroom, brushing my teeth, doing my whole skincare routine, and anything within the skincare routine that you can do that you enjoy, put it in there. Like, I got myself a little headband to, like, put my hair back when I wash my face, which has, like, little cat ears. Let me see if I can get it. So, one thing I like doing when going to the bathroom is put on my trusty headband which has cute little cat ears and I just enjoy putting it on every night so that's a little thing that motivates me to go wash my face go do my skincare routine another thing I like to do while I'm brushing my teeth because brushing my teeth is just so boring so dull that it's physically painful so I'll kind of do things while I'm brushing my teeth to make it more interesting So something I've been doing recently is doing breathing exercises. Uh, The exercise that I do the most is the 478 technique, meaning you breathe in for four, hold it for seven, and breathe out for eight. It is a little bit difficult if you're just starting out. I'm a singer, so I'm used to holding my breath for longer periods of time. If you're only starting out, I really recommend sitting down the first time you do it or lying down the first time you do it some people it makes them go to sleep immediately so that's actually also something that you can try while in bed and you're trying to go to sleep breathe in for four hold it for seven breathe out for eight so two other gadgets that i got myself that make me excited for sleep is this 
sleep pillow. It's an ergonomic sleep pillow that has a shape that ideally supports your neck. And I got my own cover for it, which is something silk. I don't know if it's actual silk or if it's just like satin, but it's supposed to have less friction on your hair. And I think it might even be antibacterial so that it's it's just better for your skin on your face. I have one in turquoise and I have one in gold. I just like switching them up because it just makes me excited for additional health benefits. And then, <laughs> oh my, here is my trusty weighted blanket. It's it's 13 kilos, so it's quite heavy. This baby is amazing, especially for people with anxiety and autism and sensory disorders. It just feels like a hug and it's scientifically proven to help you with sleep, even for neurotypicals. It's great. It's supposed to be about 10% of your body weight. This one is 13 kilos because it's also uh, 200 by 200 centimeters. So the bigger it is, the heavier it has to be as well. I find personally that I need a little bit more than 10% because when I was in Scotland, I had an 11 kilo weighted blanket and somehow it just wasn't heavy enough. I felt like it could be heavier but maybe it also wasn't as heavy as it said it did because this feels so much heavier than the other one and it's only two kilos heavier. Whereas this one actually almost feels a little bit too heavy. Also, I did lose quite a bit of weight since then, but still, I lost about 10 kilos, so it shouldn't make that much of a difference. Yeah, try different types out. I know you can get them on Amazon. This one only costs like, they are a little bit expensive. This one costs me like, I think 70 or 80 francs. Well, actually, it was a Christmas present from my mum. I know you can get them for like, I think the one in the UK I got for 50 pounds. Then there are a, there are sort of higher class ones that are around two or 300. I've never tried the, the high end expensive ones. Maybe they're better, maybe not. I think you can also test them as well with some of the online ones that I found they you can basically test out the weight for about 100 days but yeah I was just I don't know I was convinced that I wanted 13 but now I kind of wish that I didn't get it that heavy also the first night is going to feel a lot heavier you get used to the weight pretty quickly so it might feel a little bit weird give it some time and you're gonna notice that it is just gonna help you so much to go to sleep and stay asleep and that the sleep that you have is a lot deeper and better quality Okay, where was I? Other gadgets include this amazing face mask. Uh, this is actually a gift from my uncle in Australia. It goes all around your eyes. Oh god, now I can't see anything anymore. I just love how it hugs your face and that it has Velcro so that you can really adjust it to however you want it to be. Because I hate it when I have sleeping masks that are just either too tight or not tight enough. This one you can absolutely adapt to how you want it to be. Um, I was actually so disappointed because I got it when I was in Australia last year over Christmas and uh, I was so looking forward to using it on the plane. But then for some reason, I, oh, I just hit the microphone. For some reason, it, I think it fell on the floor or something. I couldn't find it anymore. I even asked the person next to me to stand up to help me find it and I couldn't. So I had a really bad night's sleep and then I think I woke up quite early and I heard people talking about something that they found and I thought this I think that's my sleep mask and then I asked them and then it was so sad sad times but yeah really really great also what I love about this is that it kind of holds your headphones in place if you are listening with headphones at night really recommend it's also so soft it's so nice thank you Florin and Catherine for this wonderful gift. The next gadget I'm gonna show you are earplugs. I have the Loop Engage earplugs. I might do a separate review of these for you personally. I got them because I struggle with auditory processing disorder, especially in loud places like in a bar. And I find that they're not as great as I was hoping them to be, but also maybe it's just the model that I got. What I do like is that they are quite comfortable and they kind of look cute too. I did also wear them in a club once when I just found that it was way too loud and they're absolutely better than just regular earplugs. So, and you can, you also get like a little white thingy additionally, so you can make it even quieter. So they have different models. You can also get the quiet ones that are specifically for sleep. But yeah, I don't tend to noise at night, doesn't tend to bother me as much. So that's why I got the Engage ones. 
But let me know if you have good or bad experiences with them and if you maybe have a different type of uh, special earplugs that you like, that you recommend, and then I'll try them out. Next, what else do I have? Other things that you could do is drink sleepy time tea. I did that a lot in Scotland. Uh, you can get different kinds. I really like the taste of them as well and it it kind of prepares me mentally as well and it it's kind of a ritual that I like and gets me excited for bed and it just prepares your body and brain for like hey okay this is we're doing this now we're actually going to bed. Another thing that you could do is aromatherapy. I got into that when I was doing a really deep dive on therapy and different methods and everything. I'm not sure how I feel about the actual therapy aspect of it but just getting like a little oil burner and just putting some essential oils in there like lavender or anything that makes you sleepy it could be a really nice addition to your ritual the next tip i have for you is regarding restless leg syndrome if you have restless leg syndrome there are several things that you can do to help Researchers believe that restless leg syndrome is caused by an iron and dopamine deficiency, which of course is already very common with people with ADHD. So maybe iron supplements could help you. I know magnesium definitely helps and dopamine, obviously. Tell me where to get some of that, please. And of course, the gadget that I've already mentioned several times is the Fitbit, which also just makes me more excited about going to sleep so that I can see my sleep stats the next day. If you get the premium version, it will even tell you what kind of sleep animal you are and stuff like that, which, yeah, that I don't really care that much about that. But it does tell you a lot of different things about your sleep. It will track what sleep phase you are in at each point of the night. It also shows your oxygen levels throughout the night, which is going to be a very good way to figure out if you have sleep apnea or not. It also shows you trends because you can also, of course, link it to your period, to your cycle. You can take notes of mood and just other symptoms that you're experiencing. And then you have an overview of everything and you can analyze it better. For me, that is one motivation to get to bed sooner because it's actually documented and for some reason that makes it more important. I want to prove to the technology that I <laughs> that I can go to sleep at a reasonable time. As we mentioned before, really important thing is to limit your caffeine intake to no caffeine after 2 p.m. let's say. Uh, it takes about I think 12 hours for caffeine to get out of your system again. I'm not 100% sure if it on that number and I'm sure it also depends on how much caffeine you have and each body is probably also different but just to be safe maybe don't drink any after maybe even 12 like just limit coffee to the morning and energy drinks. Now when it comes to blue light if you are one of those people who like to work right up until the moment that they go to bed or spend a lot of time on your phone before going to sleep I recommend getting a pair of blue light blocking glasses. These are just my regular glasses, but I made sure that when I bought them that they would have a blue light filter as well because I knew that that's going to be a problem for me. In general, lighting is very important. So I have the Philips Hue light system and before I want to start going to bed or just in general in the evening, I will make sure that the lights are dimmed down at least an hour before going to sleep. So I'll dim them down to sort of relax mode. I'll have them a little bit warmer, a little bit darker. And then right before going to bed, I'll turn them down even more just to make sure that my body is aware, hey, we're going to go to sleep now because it has happened quite a few times that I'll forget about it. And I'll have this really bright white light on that helps me concentrate. But then of course, it's signaling to my body, hey, it's still daytime. So you are still in working mode. You don't have to go to sleep yet. In general, a light system could help a lot as well with waking up in the morning. For example, with the Philips Hue, you can actually set an alarm. You can actually say, I want you to turn on at eight o'clock in the morning. That is also going to help you regulate your circadian rhythm because your eyeballs are going to get the sense that there is light outside and going to wake up. So you can absolutely try that. It's never really worked well for me because the light will just go on and I won't even notice and then the light is just on for no reason. But try it out, see if that helps you. You also don't have to get the Philips Hue system because that's a bit more on the expensive side. That was also a Christmas present from years ago that I got. There are several other smart lighting hubs that you can get. 
I think Ikea sells some. I don't know. There's lots of different third parties. Also something that I have that I really love is my Google Home. It's not really helped me a lot in terms of sleep, but it helps me in terms of lights because I could be in bed and I can tell Google to turn off or on the lights. So for example, if you're in bed waking up and you want the lights to go on but you just can't get out of bed, you can tell Google to turn on the lights and that might motivate you to get out of bed faster as well. If you do have the possibility to avoid screens altogether at night, I would recommend doing that. There are so many studies that show that screens before bedtime is going to affect your sleep. So maybe read a book or listen to a podcast or maybe you're listening to this podcast (laughs) or play a game with your family or I don't know. I struggle with that. I do look at my screen before bedtime, but what I will do is I make sure that I dim down the screen as much as I can without it bothering me. For example, I'll listen to a podcast and I'll play solitaire on my phone, for example, but then make sure that first of all, night mode is switched on. Uh, On iPhones, I'm sure on most smartphone devices, you can put in a setting that after midnight, for example, it sets the lights, it it kind of turns off the blue light and then the screen goes goes kind of yellowish. I don't know, maybe it's placebo, but for me, I feel like it helps. There's also different things you can put on your phone that could help you with this. Turning certain social media channels to silent mode, for example, or in general, just turning your phone to silent mode can help just not getting any more notifications. For me especially, I mean, I think the watch stops sending me messages when it realizes that I'm asleep. But if it thinks I'm still awake because I only just went to sleep, it's still going to buzz every time I get a message. And then, of course, I want to look at the message and then I'm going to want to reply to the message and then it's a whole thing. So, yeah, silent mode could work. I think there are also apps that help you limit your screen time that just shut off and don't let you use certain social media channels anymore after a certain time. I know that some people do it with just turning off the Wi-Fi after a certain time that you can you can set like a plug. I think you if you plug it into this sort of timed plug, you can automatically have it shut off at a certain time. That might help for you. I live with other people, so that's not really an option for me, but maybe it is for you. Another really important thing is to be able to sleep, our bodies need to cool down to a certain degree. So, and this is especially I want to say this is especially important for ADHDers, although I'm not 100% sure, but making your sleeping environment cooler is important. Opening the window, for example, or if it's summer or you live in a hot climate, some kind of fan might help. I mean, if you just have a fan blowing at your face, that might be difficult, then that might be even more uncomfortable. But there are certain fans that you can get that have like a humidifier as well, so it's mainly the wetness that cools you down and that's also going to help your throat in general. I have a humidifier. I'm not going to get out now. I have two different types of humidifiers but that's also because I'm a singer. I have one that's just can always be on and I sometimes have that on overnight. I actually very recently got this which is a it's a nebulizer but I'm using it as a vocal steamer. It's just yeah it helps your voice. There's different settings that you can set it to and theoretically you can also have that next to your bed but this does make a bit of a sound so I don't like having this on next to my bed. I also just feel like it's a bit of a waste of energy and having it right next to my bed also feels weird because I'm scared that my bed and the fabric is going to get all moist and moldy and yucky and I don't know. The next technique that I've heard of that I rarely do myself but could help you is doing a brain dump before going to sleep. So if you find that you have racing thoughts that you just can't shut off your mind, take a notes app or even better take an actual notepad and write in with pen and paper. I think they've they've shown that that the actual act of writing something with your hand onto actual paper does something else with the brain than typing it out on your phone or a laptop or something. Also, of course, screen time. That can help to just sort of release everything that's in your head down onto paper, knowing you don't need to think about it anymore. It's there, it's down, it's not going to get lost. And it's just sort of this release strategy. I personally struggle with writing stuff down because then I'll just continue writing and writing and writing and writing. Something that I've done a few times is to record a voice message and I'll basically do what I call a self-therapy session where I'll just talk into the microphone, say anything that's on my mind and verbally process through whatever is going through my head because that's also going to kind of help me 
put things into perspective and know that it's recorded because something why I then often don't want to go to sleep is because I feel like I don't want to forget what I'm thinking about and then by doing a session like that I can get it all out of the way also by the end of it you're probably going to be tired and by recording it on a voice memo you're not looking at a screen you're just holding the phone to your face and you can still turn the phone off like the screen off the danger there though is I have done it before where I'll just end up speaking for two hours straight and then go to bed even later but still that helps to at least release some of it something else you could try is masturbation because masturbating releases endorphins and makes you more in touch with your body and takes your mind off of the day for example, all of this can really help relax and get ready for bed. Um, There was actually a study to show the different reasons why people masturbate, and especially for women. uh, This is a quote from the National Library of Medicine. Women were significantly more likely than men to endorse to help me fall asleep as a reason why they masturbate. Um, 25.7% of women said this, and only 21.4% of men said the same thing. Not that big of a difference, I would say, like 5% difference. Yeah, at the same time, it could also wake you up more because it gets you all riled up. I know that there are some people that also, if they have sex at night, they won't be able to sleep afterwards and some people can fall asleep right away. Do wait till you've done with sex, though, before you fall asleep. Might be considerate to your partner. Yeah, in regards to porn and falling asleep, I would suggest checking out audio porn. Because if you're watching porn on a screen, again, you have the screen time. Audio porn, something I discovered recently, especially for women, good stuff, good stuff. I know this sounds kind of cheesy, but it really does allow for just more imagination. And that means that all of the yucky stuff that you don't like seeing in porn, but you tolerate because it's porn, you don't get anymore. And you can just have your ideal picture in your head and you still have all the nice voices to guide you through it. So if you need to go to sleep, try that out. Sorry, that's my flatmate coming home. Yes, I call my mum my flatmate. Now, if you struggle with restless leg syndrome, unfortunately, there is no cure as such, but there are some things that you can do. One thing is to take magnesium throughout the day. I would suggest even taking it three times a day. Uh, This is also going to help with anxiety and in general with a lot of different things. It's going to help you relax more to sleep. And then, of course, it's also going to help relax your muscles for the restless leg syndrome difficulties. Another thing that you can do is change the temperature of your feet. So, for example, you could put a cool cloth on your feet or a warm cloth. What I like to do is just move the blanket slightly away from my feet so that my feet can get some cool air. That helps me. The days when I'll get restless leg syndrome more than other days is usually because I didn't exercise enough or I ate a lot of sugary junk food stuff because then my body's just not gotten enough movement throughout the day and somehow it builds up energy. So exercising a lot throughout the day making sure that you get out of bed, walk around at least a little, is definitely going to help. And having a good diet will also help you. Then, of course, the times when I struggled the most with it was every time that I had some kind of operation or I was in hospital. So recently I was in hospital for appendicitis and I was in there for about two weeks and my legs really went crazy. So I did some research and this is what I found. These are two products that I found very helpful. This is a cooling spray. I actually bought it for the Greenfield Festival, music festival, because like if you're walking around and dancing around all day, uh, your feet can get kind of tired. So it's just a little, wait, my feet are a little bit dirty. And it just gives it a light cool down effect. That helps me a lot. Then here is kind of a similar thing. This is a cooling gel. It says here, well, this is in German, bei schweren, müden Beinen, kühlend, wohltuend und lindernd, stimuliert die Mikrozirkulation. It stimulates the microcirculation, apparently. I don't know what that means, but we'll go with it. It has quite an intense smell, just so you know. If you're sensitive to smells, maybe avoid it. Um, it's just, it's a very mentally smell, because that's what it, I think that's how it cools you down. Personally, I prefer using the spray just because it's easier to do and I don't get my hands dirty but it's not as effective as the gel the gel will be more but again I'm gonna have to 
put it on with my hands and then I'll probably want to go wash my hands because I'm scared of getting it in my eyes and so on and so forth. Also, I deliberately didn't mention the brands because I have no idea what brands they are and it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's going to be different in each country anyway. I'll see if I can put a link below to some kind of cooling gel that you can find on Amazon or let me know if you have experience with different kinds of gels and if you have a preferred brand or not. Also something that's going to help with restless leg syndrome is stretching. You might also have hypermobility like me, so you can do stuff like this. I like stretching before bed because it also just relaxes me, but it also helps with restless leg syndrome. So especially stretching your legs is very important. Stretching the, uh, what's it called? The Varden. Your calf muscles. Stretching your calf muscles is very important. Also an exercise I got in hospital because I was struggling a lot with it is doing what they called like calf pumps. So just tensing your feet quickly and then pushing them like kind of, can you see it? Oh my God. Basically flexing your foot and relaxing it again quickly is going to exhaust the muscle and then it's going to be tired and it's going to relax. Now, I mentioned hypermobility. If you also have hypermobility, you might know the feeling that when you're asleep, your shoulders just kind of go together and it feels like they could almost touch the next morning. It's very, very bad. So I will often wake up with a lot of shoulder pain, a lot of back pain. So something that I find that helps me a lot with this is using a scarf to basically create a back tie. If you're watching this on video, I'm going to demonstrate it. If you're listening, tough luck. So you'll put it around behind your back and then put it over your shoulders. And then the loose ends at the top, you're going to pull down underneath the back strap that you just created. I'll show you. That's what it's supposed to look like. And then this is now basically going to stop your shoulders from going together. And for me, that really helps to not have as much back pain in the morning. Also, having the weighted blanket, to be honest, and listening to sleep podcasts, I will lie flat on my back. Usually I struggle to sleep when I'm lying flat on my back. But if I do this whole ritual thing where I'm like, okay, I'm going to lie down, do my breathing exercises, listening to the podcast, I have trained myself to be able to lie on my back to fall asleep. And that's also going to help with back problems. Ugh. God, my back. God. By the way, if you have back problems like I do, partially linked to hypermobility, go and see a chiropractor. I've never been to a chiropractor before and recently I did go because my masseuse recommended it and it helps. And if you're in Switzerland, it's covered by your health insurance. What else? A gadget that I am yet to try out and I'm really excited about is red light therapy. I have been doing quite a lot of research on that and I'm sure that I'm going to make a dedicated video on it in the future because red light therapy is supposed to help with several aspects of mental health but also improve your sleep and I think I have read that it can be especially beneficial for people with ADHD so I'll keep you updated. If you have experience with red light therapy please do let me know either in the comments, in the show notes or directly get in touch with me over Instagram. Try to avoid naps because especially later at night if you want to sleep over lunchtime I know some people do do that my mother does that for example every now and again and I know that in certain countries that's the norm but try not to do it too late because that's just going to make it harder to fall asleep again and it's going to sort of mess up your system if you're going to take naps then take them at the same time every day I would say if you find that you are lying in bed, you can't go to sleep, and more than 15 to 20 minutes have passed, get up, stand up, do something else, and then go back to sleep. Because if you lie in bed awake for too long, your body is going to get used to the idea that lying in bed can mean being awake. The same thing goes for try to avoid spending all day in bed. I know I'm one to talk because I often do that, but especially working in bed is very, very bad because your brain needs to associate bed with sleep and work with somewhere else and not sleep. I do realize that I struggle more with going to bed and falling asleep at a reasonable time when I've spent all day in bed. So very important thing to bear in mind. I mean, you know, go to the sofa and work there, but as long as your bed or preferably your whole bedroom 
is just your sanctuary for sleep, the better. I can't because I have my desk in my room. So if you've been getting value out of this episode, please give it a quick five star rating and subscribe and like and follow for more. On we go with tips for waking up in the morning. So a tip that I've heard of before is taking your stimulant ADHD medication half an hour before you have to get up. So when the first alarm rings, you take your Ritalin or whatever you take. And then half an hour later, the second alarm is going to go or I don't know how many alarms you're going to have in between. And then you actually get up because the stimulant medication is, of course, going to wake up your body to a certain degree. It's going to elevate your heart rate and it's going to make it easier to actually get up. And the bonus is that it's already working when you need to get ready in the morning so to go for a shower and to transition from one task to the next which we all know is very difficult for ADHD people. For me personally that hasn't really worked as well it just didn't wake me up enough but it might work for you. Then another thing that I like to do I'm not sure if it's going to work for you the same depending on if you in general get up to go to the toilet during the night quite a lot because I don't. I've once I am asleep, usually I do sleep through quite well. But to trick myself to get up in the morning, I will drink a lot of water the night before. Not too much so that I actually have to get up and go to the toilet during the night, but just enough so that by the time that morning hits, I'm going to need the loo and it's going to be a lot harder for me to stay in bed. Life hacks, eh? I'd love to know if that's something that would work for you as well. So try it out. Let me know. Something I used to do more and I don't do as much today is put on hype music in the morning. Well, actually, what I used to do is I'd set my alarms strategically back when people still used iTunes rather than a subscription service like, well, I guess now you have Apple Music. I'm not quite sure how that works because I use Spotify. But I would set different songs for different alarms. I would set the first few alarms as like more quiet, more kind of like ease into the morning. And then by the time I have to really get up, I'll put on something like Na 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 from My Chemical Romance or ACDC or just something that's like, you need to get up. Um, I mean, that's one strategy. What I mean by this tactic though is to actually put on hype music like you get up you don't really want to get up yet but you sort of awake and have a playlist on the go that really hypes you up and get up and do a little dance honestly that's a great way to start the day anyway it's something to look forward to and it's gonna get your dopamine rushing and that's gonna help you to wake up I should do that more often I should try that I should like actually map out a schedule of like you know what I'm actually gonna try and hold myself accountable, get my sleep rhythm to then and then, and try out the sleeping, the hype music hack. We'll see. I'll keep you updated. Another thing that might help you, depending on what your schedule is and why you want to get up earlier, what you need doing, if you're working in a nine to five or not, something that helps me is to schedule something in the morning. So, because I do know that I do get more done if I wake up earlier in the day. So something I've been doing recently is booking some kind of gym class morning-ish. When I say morning, for me, that's like 9.45 or maybe the 11.30 class or something like that. I've been doing Aquafit. I really recommend that, by the way. It's so fun, especially if you have pots or if you if you struggle with exercise, Aquafit is great because it takes all of the weight off of your body. And it's just so much fun. And you're just surrounded by old women who don't care and don't judge you. And I don't feel like I need to compete with like little spindly bobby humans that are just pure muscle and metabolism. It's great. I love it. And also it can be incredibly exhausting, but it also doesn't have to be. You can participate as much as you want to because also the rest of you is underwater. So no one can actually see what you're doing. I love it. And then I'll continue to go to the sauna afterwards. Loving the sauna. Where was I? Yeah, so scheduling something that's early-ish is really good. Also with doctor's appointments, I like scheduling them around 12 because that means that I do need to get up by like 10 o'clock. And that's already a massive improvement from usually me getting up around 1 or 2 p.m. That way I'm motivated, I get out of the house, and then when I come back, I still have enough time to do whatever else I wanted to do in the day. And also just being out of the house, getting the fresh air, getting some movement in is just going to help get your day started. So even if you just make a body doubling date with a friend or with yourself, 
literally just say, hey, I'm going to go and work in Starbucks today. Maybe not Starbucks because they're evil, but I do still love Starbucks. I'm embarrassed to admit. But it doesn't have to be Starbucks. Any co- coffee shop that you want to say, hey, I'm going to go work here. Joe and the Juice. Joe and the Juice is a great place. I don't know if they're in every country, but in Switzerland, they definitely do exist. And pretty sure they exist in the UK as well. And America? I'm not sure. Anyway, tell yourself, I'm going to be there by 10. If you're not there by 10, set yourself some kind of consequence. Or other way around, say, if I make it by 10, then I can reward myself with my favorite drink or something like that and if I'm late then I have to get something else or only drink water or something that's cheaper or something that maybe is good for you but you don't actually want you know what I mean that could help and then as mentioned before getting smart lights might be something for you making sure that you have some kind of lighting system that automatically wakes you up in the morning and again this is really important to keep your circadian rhythm in the right place. I literally just saw a snippet of the new episode from Diary of a CEO and there they were talking about delayed circadian rhythm as there's like there's like a disorder that you can get which is like unnaturally delayed circadian rhythm. Like our circadian rhythm is already delayed but if we unnaturally delay it even more and don't have a regular sleep schedule There are so many other disorders that can come from that. There's basically nothing in your life that it won't affect having a fucked up sleep schedule. So get your sleep schedule on track. Then this is actually a gadget that helps with stabilizing your circadian rhythm. It's actually for something else. Let me explain. This is called a sad lamp. It's for seasonal affective disorder. And basically what it does is it shines light into your eyeballs, which mimics the sun, meaning that it's actually giving you, I think it even gives you vitamin D and it makes you happy because, you know, the sun gives you happy hormone stuff. And that's what a lot of people who get seasonal affective disorder struggle with because they don't get enough sunlight on their eyes. Well, they don't get enough sunlight through just over their entire body but the way how our brain also processes light is actually through our eyes which I find really fascinating so with using this lamp it's imitating the sun so if you use this when you first wake up that's going to make it even more clear to your body and your brain that this is now morning and it's wake up time and then when it's dark it's sleepy time and it's night time it's quite bright let me show you oh god so okay Basically, what you do is you hold it about you hold it about 30 centimeters away from your eyes and you don't have to actually stare into it. You can also just I think you even not supposed to or like every now and again, you should look down a tiny bit. But if you stare at it for too long a time, your eyes are going to kind of hurt. You might also get a headache the first few times you use it. Just try it out. Maybe it will work for you. Maybe it won't. You can do anything else really. You could also just watch TV or listen to a podcast or something or have breakfast. I, when I used it more, was also in, in Glasgow because also in Glasgow, the sun does not shine ever. That's not true. Actually, that's a lie. It shines about for two weeks out of the year. You'll get sunshine in Glasgow. So I struggled a lot with seasonal affective disorder and it really, I did find that this lamp helped yeah increase it bit by bit just read the instructions read the manual i think it helps yeah don't overdo it that's important why am i doing it now this is like it's 20 to 8 in the evening at the time of be filming this video so i shouldn't actually be looking into it for too long oh, there's my dopamine hit for the day the sunlight that i did not get today because i woke up at 1 p.m and it is winter currently and i shut the blinds three hours after getting up to film this video no sunlight for me. Okay. But what I will say to all of this is don't try it all at once. Try and maybe make a list, maybe save this episode for later, keep coming back to it and pick out two or three things that you think would be fun to do, fun to try out. Because if you're going to try everything at once, you are going to lose your momentum immediately. You are going to think, oh my God, I can't do all of these things. I can't buy all of these gadgets at the same time. And then you're just going to give up and then nothing's going to come from it. I didn't buy all of these things at the same time. I either got them as a gift or bought them for myself over several years. And uh, I will say that I 
I do like spending money on gadgets like this, especially for sleep, because I know how important sleep is. And I am justifying it by saying sleep is one of the most important things in our life to improve our life quality. So I'm allowed to spend a little something if it's going to make me happy and in return make it easier for me to get a good night's sleep, then that is absolutely worth the investment for me. But also in terms of exercises and rituals and even just sleep meditation episodes, I'm going to shift it up every now and again because you need to keep it interesting. Try a few of these things for maybe a week or two, see what it does, then maybe start implementing the next one and the next one. Maybe set yourself road marks, like maybe the first of every month or have random, randomly splatter notes throughout your calendar as little check-in reminders of like, hey, how's your sleep doing? How have you been sleeping recently? As a sort of incentive to give it some thought and to reflect because quite often we'll start doing something like that, go all in and then give up halfway. Please don't do that when it comes to sleep. With any other hobby, that's fine. Sleep is something that I'm repeating myself at this point. I'm a broken record. Sleep is important. So keep it fresh, keep it light, keep it interesting, keep it motivating. Let it give you dopamine. Try different strategies. Let me know what works best for you because I really, really want to know. Or do you have any strategies that I haven't mentioned? Let me know. A lot more research has to still be done on the link between sleep and ADHD. There is already quite a lot. But there's still just so much we don't know, not just about ADHD, but also about sleep in general. And this goes back to a wider topic of why it's so important that we research enough about our own disorders. I know so many people with ADHD who don't even know that sleep is linked to ADHD. And they thought they just struggle with sleeping because they they are not disciplined enough. And then they feel so relieved when I tell them, hey this is part of ADHD, you're not broken, this makes sense. So to learn more about this issue, here, here, go check out my next episode. Looking forward to seeing you next time. No, that was a really bad ending. Stay hydrated, everyone. That just splashed in my face. Oh my god, I'm stuck in my hair. Right. There are so many different reasons why we struggle with going to sleep. No, I can't do it again, otherwise my brain is completely gonna fall asleep. Insert what I said before. This is shit. The shadow. Shadow, shadow. In the shadow. Shadow. Has that been there the whole time? Okay. Anyway, 